Cosmoetica, of course, is not particularly concerned, it seems to me, with um, what's going on in popular culture, which, of course, makes you eminently commendable. But nonetheless, in the reviews that you're seeing to post and the um, essays that you're getting from your variety of contributors, have you seen any reflection or do you see is it a completely divided experience those who are highly concerned and involved in the arts and literature etc versus the rest of the culture which is stumbling along in the dark um i think i think i i had had both i mean i i, I get for every piece i think i have something like 1200 maybe plus essays online I think I, I've done about 1,100 essays. I think I've got about 16 or 1,700 essays and about 11 or 1,200 of them are mine. Of the five or 600 essays from other people, I mean, th there's a variety. I used to, early on, have uh, have uh, lesser writings, people who just wrote a, an odd piece, and I'd be like, okay, I, I'm, I'm trying to be more broad-minded. I, I usually, I, I had a guy th just this week send me some bizarre little 250, 300 word piece that was uh, a de facto short story, but he thought it would be a good bylines thing. It was about something of, uh, about being in the South and, and something his aunt said or something. It was, it was absolute nonsense. So he's someone who's just writing for his own own self and, and not well. There are people, uh, Alex Sheremet, I had mentioned, uh, who uh, has been written a number of pieces on Cosmoetica. There was a fellow named Len Holman who for about three or four years sent me really terrific little political pieces. Uh, if I had if I had uh, more of a political bent and more time, I would have written uh, pieces quite similar to that. Uh, and I had probably about a 90 to 95 percent agreement with his own political opinions. Um, so, I mean, yes and no. To a certain extent, I think there are there are some people, I, I think that there's always going to be a minority of people. I tell Jessica this all the time. You can't, you can't write for the masses. People who write for the masses uh, put a shelf life on their things. You go to Project Gutenberg or the Internet Archive or similar sites like that, and you Google, you can Google. Um, I'm, I'm doing a book, a Western book, so I've been looking up some of the Western works of Hamlin Garland or or Bret Hart and, and people like that, uh, Jack London uh, from the 1800s. These are some of the bigger names. But then there are lots of other books by people who, when I look up the names, they say, oh, yes, this was the best-selling uh, dime store novelist of 1896. Haven't heard of him. Because his stuff w was didn't have the depth of a London, didn't have the depth of an Ambrose Bias, didn't have the depth of a Bret Hart. And so these people reflected their times and... There's a there's a minor value in that. If you want to know what the Victorian era was like, and you want to read like some of the female writers of the day who wrote these sort of little ooh tee hee, uh, how how to transgress in polite society type books, there are plenty of them at Project Gutenberg, and and they're kind of fascinating the way it would be to look at sort of like you know a monkey that came out of a, a brain experiment and is sort of retarded and off in the corner just banging his head against the wall. But they don't say anything deeper about the time the way that a Jack London uh, uh, short story might. And yes, London has some problems because he he plagiarized a number of other people's works here or there. But there's enough of his own stuff that you can see that that he was a, a man of uh, great writing talent. Um, in the same way, you know, uh, Cosmoetica is not going to capture the immediate zeitgeist. You're not going to get particularly... Uh, cogent uh, ideas about, uh, you know, the latest uh, crap Hollywood blockbuster uh, about, uh, I saw the other day, some some bimbo named Megan Fox was divorcing her 90210 television show husband or something. And, uh, you know, these are the kinds of things that are, 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 no one's going to care about. But I'll give you an example. I just, about 12, 13 years ago, I wrote an essay called The Day, which I, I, in, I think it was in 02, I said that once these telescopes we were putting up to discover exoplanets finds an Earth-like world, I say within one century of that, we will have faster than light speed because we will see a gold rush of, of capital going in to make uh, spaceships that can go 
to that planet and exploit it. Let's say it's a Jurassic type world and it, 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 there's no, there's no uh, sentient beings on there that, that could stop us. We will spend all the money and you know even if it's 20 light years away, we'll develop in a century starships that will get there in five months. And I, I just I just read three or four weeks ago about this this exoplanet that's a little bit larger than the Earth, but seems to have the chemical signature of life. Now it's it, it hasn't been confirmed, but but I I, I then read uh, about uh, some private funding and and people you know that that uh, uh, some private uh, investors are saying all they are wanting is that once they find out that they have that gold mine at the at the end of the the 20 light year tunnel or whatever they are going to be putting money into it and that's exactly what i predicted and that's a good example of 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 a piece of writing that just over a dozen years or so later has more relevance than anything writing about the kardashians or whatnot and i think that's that's the kind of thing that does over time stick out you know, we are. There's never been anything like the internet before, so I can't. I can't give an exact analogy to the past, but I can say that people who have written things that get to the fundamental parts of humanity last longer. These novels that were written in the the late uh, Victorian era that had that were just basically talking about polite society and didn't have any depth. They don't last. But you read someone like uh, Willa Cather. If you read her novels, she was writing, excuse me, she was writing looking back a, a few decades from when she was writing in the early 20th century. And her stuff, her stuff still, you can read it today and, and you're still there and, and, and there's nothing in her writing that has dated. It really hasn't. Yes, you could say maybe a, a little phrase here or there, but there's nothing dated. There's nothing, it, it, it hasn't taken on the pattern of the past. Uh, a Willa Cather's work produces. You can, for for all of its you know kind of unique artifice, a Moby Dick is far more relevant and far more cogent than anything that a Jonathan Franzen has written. I mean, Jonathan Franzen writes bad soap operas. I watch I've watched soap operas on television. I know good soap opera from bad soap opera. Jonathan Franzen is a bad soap opera writer. Richard Russo is a bad soap opera writer. But they're actually not as bad as the the David Foster Wallaces and these people, these postmodern people who want to just throw words at, at, at people and, uh, you know, uh, throw ideas and throw this and, and say, well, you just have to, you just have to deal with it. It's on you. No, if you're an artist, you're telling me something. And, and so I think, I think that, that, that Cosmo Wetica does, will, will perdure. And I think it will probably be more highly thought of 50 years from now after I'm dead probably than it is now. I, I think that's sort of inevitable, but again, I can't I can't predict the future. But I I, I do think that that people, the, the fans that have 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 read, and I I estimate that I probably have somewhere between fifty and a hundred thousand people out there that three or four or five times a a, a week come and read something or, or look at you know at something, and and they're the people that keep coming back week after week, week after week, and then there's maybe another half a million people that come back once or twice every month. So you're talking, you know, maybe half a million people on the planet are, are regular devotees of it, which is nothing to sneeze at. I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not going to uh, deny that. But again, you have to put it, you have to put it in perspective. Uh, Cosmoetic isn't going to change the world in the short time. No, no work of art does. You know, you mentioned Guernica, the, the great Picasso uh, painting. And, uh, you know, that's, that's a painting that at the time he was the most famous artist in the world. So that sort of had a head start. So that's probably not a good idea. Van Gogh is probably a better example. If you look at some of his paintings and even some of the the less Van Gogh-y type paintings like uh, the potato eaters. And you look at what that says about uh, the human condition and you can you could you could transpose those people into some place in Africa or South America, uh some place uh, in Indochina or you know uh uh the Indian Peninsula and you can you can see the same types of people and that's a work that has slowly filtered out in in his lifetime that was not, you know, that was not considered one of his his bigger works, but it slowly filtered out, and it, it's touched more and more people. I've always talked about art as the ever opening cone of greatness. That when you have great art, you're gonna, you know, from from point zero when that art is created and it starts slowly disseminating, very few people are going to get it. But come back in ten, 
25, 50 years, the people who really understand great art give it the word of mouth. They spread the, the word. And those are the people that, that propound and uh, the art for. This is why you have people who were not known in their lifetime who get known after, after they are dead, when they're safely beyond and they can't, no, they can't be a threat to any power system. People, the, <laughs> people say, oh, you know, that Franz Kafka, you know, that syphilitic or what, 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 tubercular little Jew that died. Who gives a shit about him in his lifetime? He's just a goddamn clerk making whatever, you know, he made uh, in whatever little patent. No, he wasn't a patent clerk. Whatever he made doing whatever little shit thing he did. None of that mattered. The, the three or four major books that he, he did write, though, those are the things that matter. And those are the things that people connect with now. They will connect within a thousand years if we're flying around Beetlejuice. Uh, and, and that's the way, in a sense, that it should be. We should have a society. I think, for example, we should have a society where quality is, is encouraged, quality is rewarded. Of course, a lot of people will say everything's subjective and who's, who's to say. And that's why we have a grant-giving system in this country that sucks. Getting back to the, the, one of the things you mentioned earlier, I particularly, I don't mind government uh, promoting the arts, especially for kids. I don't mind the government promoting art for, for uh, you know, kids wanting to learn how to do ballet in, in their grade school. I do have a big problem with the government getting in and giving grants to people who sit on their asses, especially like uh, some of these uh, organizations, even private organizations that give like these MacArthur Genius Grants. All of these are given to professors. God damn it. I, when, I, when I've sent around for these interviews, for example, I send around to these professors. I, I'll, I'll look at, you know, uh, It'll be like, you know, uh, Josephine Hart or something at the University of Seattle, a uh, professor of, uh, of film studies. And it'll be some weird specialty like, you know, left-handed lesbian cinema. And it's like, there's a left-handed lesbian cinema? And it's like, it's like okay, but w this person also says that, you know, they're, they're a fan of, uh, you know, some, let's say, Eastern Bloc filmmaker. So you contact them. They say, oh, no, I don't have the time to do your project. What project? I'm, I'm asking for a half, uh, you know, an hour and a half, maybe uh, an hour and a half uh, to, to talk about something uh, of depth and they don't have the time to do it. And it's 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 just ridiculous. Yet yet their working hours will be, you know, a uh, one to three thirty uh, Thursday and Friday. So what are they doing that whole time? They get these grants. They go off. They you know, they'll travel and whatnot. And that's wonderful for them personally. And then five years later, they'll come back with a mediocre book that at a sub friends and level. Since 2004, I've worked full time. I've worked hard physical labor. I've done. I've I've run this website. I've done these interviews. I've uh, I've read many things that people have sent me. I I've gone. Like I said, I get 2,000 emails a week. I, I try to look at the stuff. I, I learn to weed out the people who keep sending me crap. But I, I make a genuine effort to try to find someone. I feel guilty every so often. I do get a film. I, I've gotten a few filmmakers who send me interesting films, indie filmmakers that I hope get. To be a big name someday, but I I, I go out there. I've written thirty five books, uh, in, in I, I'm just finishing up my thirty fifth book since two thousand and four in in just eleven and a half years, and that's working full time. I I my wife, if if you if you gave me a MacArthur Genius Grant three hundred thousand, I could I could that would give me you know seven eight years uh, of, of of being able to 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 just do go on a little travel do do this that and the other thing. Um, you know, instead of scraping by. And yes, people will say, well, poverty is good for the soul. Fuck poverty. You don't, I, I, I grew up poor. I saw p people starve. Po poverty is nothing but suffering. It doesn't give you inspiration. That's a load of shit. You know, this idea that, that oh, we can't reward the artist. Yes, there are going to be people, if you give them these grants and whatnot, that are going to sit around and do nothing. Get rid of them. Don't give them t to it. I don't know, though, how, how to replace that system. You know, you they, you're not going to find, you know, a few dozen Dan Schneiders that you can put into some grant giving system. So it's going to end up being corrupt anyway. So I would just sooner or not fund artists. If you want to put funds in into the arts, get the kids young, get the kindergartners or even the preschoolers, uh, get get those in elementary school and stop. Stop with this idea of trying to teach them about about uh, uh, these uh whatever artists are writing, you know, it's, it, it's good to have, let's say, uh, uh, instead of Baba the elephant and his, his colonial, uh, 
uh, ambitions that were in that book. It, it's good to have something that says, you know, you should be nice to people of all color. Uh, you should respect people having religion or not having religion. Uh, if they're gay or they're straight, if they're big or they're tall or fat, or, that, that's all fine. But you also have to, to, to get these kids' intellect going. You cannot inspire someone with bad art. Bad art is not going to reach someone. Just having a, a little sunflower that, that, that a kid, you know, does and a stick figure, that's not art. You need to, to get these people and say, because kids kids can look at a Van Gogh. They can look at uh, uh, a, a Goya. They can look at something like a, a Magritte painting that that will will cause them a dissonance in their mind and get them thinking, you know. This is not a, this is not a, what was it? This is not a, a pipe. You know, the, the famous painting by Magritte of a, of a pipe and the words underneath, this is not a pipe. Get those kids thinking about those kinds of things. Art can do that like nothing else can. You can't, you can't engage children in some great philosophical debate or treatise, but you can show them a, a, a visual picture. And at the speed of light, it will get into their mind. It will activate their, their brain juices and it'll get them thinking. And what happens is when that doesn't happen, you know, a, a child can only learn speech. Their mind is plastic enough to learn many languages up until about the age of seven or eight. After that, it gets harder. In the same way, if you want to stimulate the creativity of a, a child, you have to get to them early and keep that and keep feeding them and keep feeding them and keep feeding them. Uh, because that isn't done a lot of people who could be artists don't become artists. And I don't believe that everyone has creativity. What I'm saying, though, is if you have a class of 35 kids, or maybe now they're smaller, 20 kids, there might be one in every third class, one in 60 kids that could grow up to be a great artist. But if you don't get to that kid, he's going to end up becoming an account manager at some nameless corporation doing nothing of value to society in the future. And that's a loss. And that's that's where the money for the arts needs to go. You have to pull out that person of exceptional ability. I don't care if it's male or female, black or white or whatever. Find that person. And the only way you do that is, is, is to, to, to stimulate their minds so that they do stand out at the age of eight. And the teacher can say, you know, uh, little Susie B, she's, she's the one who's who, who in the class. Yes, we like all the other kids and, and we, we don't want them to end up homeless and, and become... Uh, drug abusers and whatnot, but too often in society, I my biggest peeve about the way society treats artists is that the too often the focus is on let's say the special ed kids, the kids that really though could make a difference, that could be the leaders of of, of the generation of the culture. They're they're not given the attention. They're, it's like it's like well they'll do do well by themselves. And I'm not talking about these people that you see in these documentaries, these pint sized Picassos, these little kids that you know they paint crap and they say oh it's it's wonderful because most of those prodigies, so called prodigies, by the age of twenty they don't become Mozart, they don't become Gershwin, they don't become uh, Eugene O'Neill. They just become frustrated people who were overpraised because the people who overpraised them put such a burden on them that they could never meet. Whereas the real kid, the kid who's bored in class and looking out the window and, you know, he or she is like, you know, why the hell am I learning algebra uh, that I'm never going to use when I can see a bird out the window and I can imagine it's flight and I can imagine that that bird has had an adventure and what, and maybe they're thinking something that could be a good poem about how the bird evaded the grasp of a, a predatory bird or something. That's the kid that needs to be reached. And the problem is we don't have people that understand that uh, uh, in, in society, not, not in the schools, certainly not in the government. So I, I personally don't trust them.